This morning, as we're looking again at what Jesus said, we're going to pick up in verse uh, 18, and we're going to find out what, what Jesus says, what it means to abide in the world, what it means to live in the world. And another way to think of it is as the consequence of abiding in Christ. So we said that there was a a fruit of abiding. Now we're looking at a consequence of abiding. This is part of the message that Jesus wants His disciples to have before He goes uh, away from them. So listen as I read from John 15, 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoke to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank You for these words. Painful words to hear, to be sure, but needful words, Father, because You have have used these. Your Son has spoken these to teach us about the world in which we live and to teach us about uh, the the meaning, the significance, and the the consequence of the relationship that we have with the Son. Would You help us, Father, to understand this rightly? Would You help us to appreciate the truth that's here And even in the discouraging words, find encouragement for ourselves. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Alright, so going back to John 15, 18, but not to John 15, 18, to John 15, 17. There's a verse that we ended with last time. I want to come back and hit that again. because uh, there's something clearly that Jesus is doing in the way that He gives us. You know, sometimes your Bible is sort of broken up into these sections and you feel like, well, this is a completely different section. But remember, this is part of one long conversation that Jesus is, ha- is having. And so how He finishes in John 15, 17 is this. He says, These things I command you so that you will... What? Yeah, He says, I want you to work out your love. And so I'm giving you these commandments. These are things that, are your, that, that you're going to do. And, and we know that he's talking about all his commandments. He's talking about the things that he said to the disciples in his earthly ministry. We're talking about all of the Word of God being his commandments. And he says, I'm saying these things to you so that you will love one another. I intend for you to work this out. Now, as he's saying that, think about what he's about to say. What, what's he about to tell them? The world's going to yeah, he's, he's just about to, to put them into the situation where he can say, let me tell you what's going on outside this room. And, and I mean, that was a very literal outside the room. At the, you know, at that very moment, they are, they are coming near the door. And he's saying, this is what I want you to know. The world out there is going to hate you as much as you're identified with me. And so that means all the more that you have to love one another. Because you can't expect to get love from the world. And if you're getting love from the world, that's, that, that tells you there's something wrong with your faith. And so when you think about the need for love, I want you to, to appreciate that. When you look around the people in this room, um, you know, this guy looks really weird. Okay? There's, he's got body odor issues. He, he talks strangely, um, uh, ungainly tall, you know, all sorts of things that are wrong with him. But he's a brother in Christ. And, and, and he's been made a brother in Christ by his faith in Christ. He's been united. He's been adopted into the family. He is now truly your brother in the heavenly places. That, that's what Christ does. And so even though he may have all these things that you don't like about him, he needs your love desperately. Because he's not going to find that love anywhere else out there. He's only going to find it with you. And so that's a burden that you bear. That's why Christ gives that commandment. He, you know, I'm putting you in in, in close proximity with these people. I'm putting you in a situation where your life is going to be immersed in their lives. Okay, think about if if Wade went outside the door and he propped up a a chair against it where we couldn't get out and then they turned the lights off at RYM and everybody left and, you know, goes home from Laguna Beach and here we are trapped in this room. 
What, what do you think is going to happen to us in that situation? How are we, how are we going to do in that? You know, I don't know, you know, Tim Pitts is already thinking, would I eat another human being if I had to to stay alive? Yes, yeah, that's, I, 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 I sense that. In fact, I'm stepping over. So the door's not locked. We're good. Everybody can leave. I've got some, some trail mix up here. We can go a little bit longer. But, but you know, it's hard, it's hard to live with somebody for a long time. You ever had the company come and stay with you? And about three days is pretty cool. And then a fourth day, wow. Okay, let's spread out again. You guys want to go get a hotel or something like that? Um, at the end of this trip, you know, you guys are all, all giddy in the vans on the way down here. And go, oh, yeah, oh, I am. And, you know, come Friday, you'll be going, you know, everybody's sleepy, tired. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't mind getting away from these, these people for a little while. I want to go to my room. I want to get in my bed. I want to sleep by myself. And, you know, not have somebody breathing on top of me and emanating these fumes. <laughs> it happens. So... So what Christ is setting us up for when He's commanding us to love one another is saying, you guys are going to be drawn close together. And sometimes it's going to be easy and sometimes it's going to be hard, but you're going to be together. And so you need to understand how desperately you need to love one another, that you need to find a way to love people that aren't lovely, that, that aren't likable, that, that have these, these issues going on with them that, that, that make it hard to be with them. And so part of what He does for that is He goes on, He gives us this next section that starts in verse 18. I want you to love one another because here's what's going to happen on the outside. Verse 18 and 19 again, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. This is the first indication that all is not well. When I was a teenager, uh, uh, I came to faith when I was uh, probably 16 years old. I had, you know, I walked the aisle once because I grew up Baptist. I walked the aisle once when I was 12 at a church camp, kind of like this. We did altar calls. You guys even know what an altar call is? Okay, all right. You've heard about these things, maybe you've experienced them. But um, it, it's a sacrament in, in the Baptist church is to have an altar call. You know, we have the Lord's Supper and baptism. Um, they, ha- they have altar calls. And so the preacher would get to the end of his sermon. And then he'd say, because anyone wants to profess faith in Christ, somebody's out there, I know they are. And every head bowed, every eye closed. Raise your hand if you want to do that. Okay, if you raise your hand, come forward to the front. And so you're in this kind of situation, your, your heart's beating really fast. And I, so when I was 12 years old, I was at camp, and I felt convicted. And I walked up up front and, and uh, um, you know, signed some card. They gave it to, to the pastor that I came to this church camp with. And he says, oh, you need to get baptized. And I said, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I, you know that's crazy, and I just I I did not go back to church because they said I need to get baptized. My 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 family didn't you know I wasn't from a Christian family, so it was completely foreign to me, and I just knew that was weird. I didn't want to be up front of anybody looking at me. This was kind of a personal, private thing. And then when I was 16 year, years old, I was at another um, uh, we called them revivals in the church because we you could schedule a revival in the Baptist church. Um, you know, Presbyterians we believe in a revival. We just say the Holy Spirit's got to be the one to start it. Um, and he does, and, he, and when there's revival, it means that the, the people change uh, inside out, and godliness starts to show up. But we had one of our scheduled revivals, had a guy preaching, um, and, uh, and this time, the Holy Spirit just slammed me. And he said, you're a sinner and you're wrong, you need to repent. And I said, you know, I'm tired of trusting in myself, I'm tired of trying to be good enough and, and, and make things right, and, and I need Jesus. And so I walked the aisle, uh, silly as it was. Um, I signed the card, and I said, I am ready to get baptized, and I don't care who sees me. And I, I cried like a baby. You know, 16 years old, football player, you know, sports guy, but I was just incontrollably sobbing. I mean, and, and we're talking, this is embarrassing, because you know, we're having the after, um, the, the after church fellowship, and people are in the line, and there I'm, you know, I, the same size I am now. And, and I'm walking through line, and I think I'm not crying. Um, because it hit me hard. But I knew from that point on, again, that, that was the point where I was convinced that I needed Christ, and Christ was the answer, and, and I was going to be accepted by God. And it didn't depend on me, it depended on Him. And there was lots wrong with my theology at that point, but there was uh, that much was true, and I have held on to that um, and, and never let go of the fact that Jesus is mine and I am His. And it's, just, it's, it's the best thing that can possibly happen to anyone. <clears throat> Whenever that happened, my life started to be transformed, and I started to become a better person and do good things. 
Uh, and I was a pretty good kid before that, and, and parents always liked me, but you know, I was trying even harder. Um, and uh, I got along well with my friends, but, but I was trying even harder there. But then suddenly, some weird things started happening. I started to find out that everybody doesn't love me and think I'm the greatest thing in the world. Um, and has anybody run into that before? And, and so some of these teachers that, that you, you, you thought a lot of and respected, and you kind of thought that everybody was a Christian because it seemed like that when I was growing up, you find out these people aren't really believers and they're not that excited about it. In my own family, somehow, you know, I'm just that stupid, but I didn't really connect the fact that my parents didn't go to church, that they didn't like Jesus too. And so this, you have this odd dynamic in the home where my parents are like, oh, that's nice, Scotty. You, you go to church and you, you have your thing there. And that's good. You run along and you go do that. But we don't, we don't do that. Um, I had friends of mine that became annoyed with me. And the, these good relationships that we used to have, they, they, they got worse. And you know, part of it was because I was convicted about things. I was like, oh, you can't go out and get drunk with those guys. I can't smoke pot with those, with those guys. And I, I had a friend that, that, that came up to me once. He goes, what happened to you, Scott? You used to be cool. Wait, how come you don't party with us anymore? And then this was my, my great triumphant moment of holy boldness. And I said, I got Jesus. <laughs> I, I'm serious. And it was like that. And I, and I walked away like, okay, I, I stood strong. I stood firm for the gospel. Um, but I was, I was embarrassed. And I knew it was, you know, it was because of Christ that I was different. I had to say that. And, and I, think, I think he blessed that because I said something and not nothing. I didn't say, I, just, you know, I don't think I want to do that anymore. I, I said it was because of Jesus. But it was, you know, it was a time to own that. And, and so w- when Jesus is saying this, he's saying, you need to expect that people aren't going to be excited about it. In fact, uh, a, a couple of months after that happened, I remember I was taking a Spanish test. Um, and I was a good student, and I was struggling on this test, and I, and I couldn't remember. It's like it was a, you know, it was a vocab list. I'm like, what is this stupid word? Um, remember, stupid is a biblical word. Um, <laughs> don't call other people that. You can call yourself that. Look it up in context. But you can call words stupid. Um, so I couldn't remember this word. And this this guy that I had grown up with, who was not a Christian at all, he, he comes over. He goes, it's this, and he he tells me what the answer is. You know, the teacher's not looking. And he wanted me to cheat because he, he wanted to say, see, you're not that good. And I remember just oh, the struggle. I'm like, he just gave me the answer. I wanted to work for it myself. Couldn't think of it. And so, you know, I'm in this moral dilemma. <sighs> now I know it. I didn't try to cheat. Do I accept the answer or not? And actually, I, I, I left it blank because, I, you know, I thought, I'm not going to, again, I haven't been that good the rest of my life, just so you know that. But in that moment, I actually said, no, I'm not going to accept it because, because I would be cheating. And um, it, but all of that was kind of breaking my heart because it it just was telling me the world was not like I thought. And what Jesus is doing right here, he's saying the world is not like you think. You know, for a while you've been able to go along and get along, and everything's been fine. But because you're about to make a commitment to me in the way that you're going to, it's going to be costly. And because it's me related, he says, if the world hates you, it's because it hated me also. Remember the, the hymn by Fanny Crosby, um, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. You guys know this one? You want to sing it all together? Okay, uh, Fanny Crosby, I'm not a big fan of, but she's got a few that you know, are good and there's some things to it. But listen to this line. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. Do you guys feel like I'm in my Savior and happy and blessed all the time? No. Why not? Because sometimes we're not happy, right? And sometimes we're, we don't seem to be blessed. Uh, you know, we know that this greater truth of our blessing in Christ, but the world's not recognizing that. They're just not wanting to reward that. And Jesus wants you to know that. And He wants you to know that this, uh, in this, you're not going to be alone. If you identify Him... In Him, you're going to identify with all His disciples and you're going to be connected in this way together and that's why you need to be loving one another. Jesus says, I chose you out of the world. Now, do you think the extent of this is just, you know, kind of that we have trouble in our peer relations and they're going to make it difficult? What's going on in the rest of the world right now? Anybody know? And again, this is not... I'm not asking you about the news. Um, I'm just talking about what's actually happening in the world that really you don't see report on the news. Uh, 
lots of Christians being murdered. Yeah, that's right. Every day, every single day, Christians are dying. Why? Because they identify with Christ. Because they're going to church. If you look at, at um, what's happened in, in the Middle East, uh, probably going back, this is kind of one of the unintended consequences of the Gulf War. Um, but some of the, the shakeup that's happened in the leadership in those countries in, in the in the in the Middle East is that. You have moved from these authoritarian dictators like Saddam Hussein um, that we said, oh, he was so bad. You guys, you know, other than older people, you don't actually know who Saddam is anymore, maybe. But he was this, this, this great enemy and he kept, you know, like flicking the nose of the U.S. and saying, you know, I could kick your tail if I needed to. I could do this. And finally, um, George W. Bush um, goes in and says, no, you can't actually. Um, well, actually, both Bushes uh, went in and, and, and dealt, but, but George W., 43, uh, 43, um, 43? I'm not sure. Okay. I think 43. Okay. Um, he goes in, he cleans him out, they arrest him, they kill him. And But if you, if you didn't know it, up to that point in time, there was a thriving Christian church in Iraq. And also in Assyria, and also in, in several of these places, only Saudi Arabia was, was the only one that was just completely, totally hostile towards Christianity. But what you've had happen is that, is that these populations have shrunk down to a tiny fraction of what they were. Like when you're talking like a 20% population of, of Christians in this country have dropped down to 0.3%. Do you, have you heard about that on the news? Is that newsworthy? You would think so that, that if, if, a, if an ethnic group was, was so pushed out of a country that they, they, they basically had become extinct, uh, you would think, yeah, somebody ought to be talking about that, but they don't. Uh, why don't they? What's the connection? Why is it that we don't hear about what's happening in North Korea or Eritrea or the Sudan, um, in, any of those countries in Christians? Why is that not newsworthy? What's that? Because the people in the news hate Christians too. That is true. Yeah, in the vast majority. Some of you are going, but wait, Fox News. <laughs> hey, here's a great book, uh, and I didn't request this. It's not a Christian book at all, but there's a book um, named How the News Makes Us Dumb. And th- this book has, like, comp- you know, you talk about breaking addictions. I used to, you know, follow lots of, of, of news and think, oh, I'm reading conservative stuff. It's good. Uh, I, I can't read the news anymore. This book has destroyed my appetite for the news. Um, and you find out from it that, that it doesn't make you smarter. So write that down, how the news makes us dumb, and give it to your dad to read um, and say, Dad, news doesn't make you as smart as you thought. The, the news is inherently liberal. And part of the reason is, is the news has a solution, or the, the, the news, when they report something, they demand a solution for everything. Have you ever noticed this? Yeah. And so, you know, it's always bad stuff. And it's kind of the idea, somebody needs to do something about this. And so who's the somebody that needs to do something about it? The government. And so it's just this natural inclination, well, this is a big problem. We need something really big to solve it. Well, government must be the one to solve the problem. You read the book of Revelation, interesting interpretation of it is not the crazy kind of dispensational interpretation that goes on there, but actually uh, an sort of an idealist view of history to say this is talking about what's always going on in history and, and part of that, that evil triumvirate that, that John talks about there is, is probably talking about government um, not, not like the secret world government and this, this kind of conspiracy but more like the Psalm 2 kind of conspiracy that, that, that David um, talks about there that there's, there's this ongoing conspiracy against God and the, the kings of the earth are taking their stand against them. They, they, they're saying, we want to cast off your bond. We don't want to submit to your authority. And so government is a rival to God. They want to solve all your problems. And that's why it doesn't matter if you have conservatives or liberals in, in power, is that all of them are working constantly to solve your problems. Again, some are better than others, somewhat less government, and that's good. But they're always going to be shouted down. And so basically what always happens is it's got to collapse under revolution and sort of you know, rebuild itself and people come to their senses. So America is like so close to just like going over the edge. Um, and the world that you're going to grow up in is going to be different unless God does something really radical to change it. Um, cool things like we're doing right now will probably not continue. Did you ever think about that? Because I mean, don't you kind of feel like, well, my, my kids will come to Laguna Beach Christian Center 
and we'll hang out here and they'll play beach volleyball and and, and three-on-three basketball tournaments and mega rec and build sandcastles for Jesus and all this cool stuff that I'm getting to do. Okay, it's not really that, but um, you just kind of think, it's always going to be here, right? But, but guess what? You know what happens is anybody that identifies themselves as a Christian, it's going to change such that people are going to target them systematically. You've heard about the, the bakers and the, the photographers that uh, didn't want to do the homosexual weddings. They said, we don't really want to celebrate this. Well, guess how hard it is for some organization to say, we want to do a, a, a gay pride week at Panama City Beach, and we want to have it at Laguna Beach Christian Center. Is there anything stopping them from doing that? And so what are, what are the owners going to do here? They're going to say, do we, do we want to host a, a, an event to celebrate homosexuality? What do you think they would do? No. Say yes. What's that? Say yes. You think they'd say yes? I, yeah, I don't think they would. I, I think they would say no. But then, what's going to happen to them after that? Yeah, there's going to be a lawsuit. They're going to take them to court. Uh, they're going to demand that they spend uh, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, probably more than that, in legal fees. Uh, do you think they have tens of thousands of dollars just lying around? You know, if you look at the state of your road thing, it's, you know, we could update some things around here. Um, it's adequate for us. You don't deserve any more. Um, but it's just it's that easy to destroy something, um, and that's what happened is that is that you know at some point somebody gets targeted and it goes away, and I've just kind of watched things systematically fall. And, and and I'm not saying this doom and gloom at all. I'm saying that's probably the reality for where you live in this country. Cool thing is worldwide. Um, no, I'm gonna say that for tomorrow. But that's, that's when we get to the Holy Spirit, and, and we'll come back to that. But um, I'm gonna save the good news for later. That'll come back for a third day. But here's, here's what Jesus is saying. Maybe we should go on to, to verses 20 and 21. Jesus says, Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. He says, not just that they hate you, they're not just going to have strong emotions against you, but he says, you know, this is kind of foreboding. He says, all these things they will do to you. Do you see that? Uh, you know, it's like, I'm okay. If people hate us. Let the haters hate. Hey, I can sing about that. Um, all right, who else? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, we all love her. We just can't, we can't help ourselves. Um, so, but, but it's not just that they hate. They don't just say ugly things. They don't just think ugly things. But they intend to do things. Um, now, what's going to result in them doing things? Why will they do things to you? Why will they go out of their way to make you suffer? What, what's what's going to be sort of the driving factor? Let, let me ask you this question. Have you noticed that militant Islamists hate Christians and that radical feminists hate Christians? Have, have you... Have you I don't know, if, you know how much you kind of sort of follow ideologies and actions, but but you've got these two groups that could not be further apart from each other. You know, do our militant Islamists are they for women drivers? No. One of my great privileges in life, and I, I will celebrate this to anyone, is when I was at um, an Air Force officer uh, course. It, they had an exchange program. We were there with officers from all over, and there, and there was actually a, a Saudi Arabian captain who was a female. And I was just kind of shocked. I didn't know that they would have a female in their military. But she was there, and she was part of our seminar where we were in this class for about four or five weeks together. And uh, one day she asked me, she says, um, uh, Captain Anderson, could I, would you mind if I borrowed um, your car? And um, I said, um, I, wait, what do you need? She goes, well, I, I wanted to go here and do something. I wanted to buy some things for my, my family and stuff. And I said, do you know how to drive? Because I thought women couldn't drive in your country. And said, so, well, they can, but only with their brother. Um, and if their brother has to take them out and they've got to, you know, no one can see them driving a car. And uh, she goes, so I know how to drive. And, um, and you know, very, you know, kind of insidious on my part. But I'm like, absolutely, you may borrow my car. You go and you drive it with all the freedom that you want and just, you know, bring it back whenever you're done. And, you know, I was, I was scared for my car. A little bit, because I don't know how good a driver can she be. But but you know, it came back in one piece, and there was subverting Islam right there in my own little way. 
Um, th- do you know, and you will hear this all the time about what happens to women. If you, know, if you guys go to college and you have any kind of liberal arts programs at all, um, you know, maybe if you go to Covenant College, you'll be okay. If, like anywhere else on the planet, though, you're going to be in trouble. Um, is you're going to hear how oppressive uh, Western Christian societies are to women, and you're going to hear this, this, just all this stuff. But oh, it's so bad to be a, a woman to, because of patriarchy and, and this, this man-centeredness and all. And they're going to go on and on and on about it. But little fun fact: Do you know where in the world women are treated the best, and they have the most rights, the most dignity, the most protection from violence? Do you want to take a guess? Christian yeah, that's right. Okay, everywhere else on the planet, in Hindu cultures, in Islamic cultures, in atheist cultures, wherever you go, where there's an anti-Christ spirit, women are treated horribly. Uh, it may not be a, an official policy that's written down anywhere. You may not be able to read it in their religious codes. You may not be able to read it in what the government says. But the fact is they are treated horribly and abused everywhere else when, when, when Christ does not have that dominion over the culture. And so even though the, these, the, these professors are screaming, oh, finally liberty, we have it, we can do whatever we want, we can do this, that, you're going to find out that women are going to be treated worse and worse in this country. Domestic violence is going to get worse and worse in this country because Christ is not the authority over people's lives. And there's going to be no restraint on evil. And so you have to understand that, that it, it's this war that goes on that is illogical, that it's irrational, um, but they can't help themselves. Why can't they help, them, help themselves? And why, is it, why does the world hate Christ? Let, let me give you four reasons that they hate Christ. But then there's a bigger reason behind it. First, they hate Him because He's the Creator. And again, you, you know that, that all, all three persons uh, of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are all attributed um, to being uh, uh, instrumental to creation, of making creation happen. And, G, and that is true of Jesus. He is called our Creator. Um, and they want to be independent of that. They don't want to know that Jesus is their creator because they don't want to know that, that they have a starting point that's dependent on somebody else. They want to be their own finite or their own infinite reference point. They don't identify with Jesus and they hate Him because they don't want to know Him as their sustainer. Again, they want to be independent. They don't want to have to rely on anybody to acknowledge that Jesus is the one that allows them to breathe and to walk and to eat and to engage with people. They don't want to accept that, that their life is in His hands. They don't want to acknowledge Him as judge because they don't want to have to answer to anyone. They don't want anyone telling them what's right and wrong because they're going to do it their own way. And the last thing is, strangely enough, why is this such a hard thing? But they don't want to acknowledge Him as Savior. Do you know why that's so hard? I mean, is it bad to be rescued? To help somebody to help you out when you're in trouble, but for some people it is, because they don't want to acknowledge that they have guilt. They don't want to acknowledge that they're weak. They don't want to acknowledge that they need somebody to rescue. They're saying, "Hey, I'm fine. I don't need anybody. I can do this myself." You ever heard that? You're from little kids, you hear it, but you hear it from adults too. I've got this thing. I don't need a rescuer. I'm not weak, but they do. And ultimately, the reason that they can't accept Christ. It's because they don't have the ability to, because their hearts aren't changed. They have hearts of stone. They don't have hearts of flesh. They're spiritually dead. How can they love Christ when they're dead? And so what does that tell you about them? How do you love your enemies who are dead? Who need the Holy Spirit? How do you help them? There is a way. You pray. Who can change a sinner's heart? The Holy Spirit alone. Again, we'll talk about Him tomorrow um, well the, the implications of not abiding in Christ we see in verses 22 to 24 he says if I had not come and spoken to them they would not have been guilty of sin but now they have no excuse for their sin whoever hates me hates my father also if I had not done among them the works that no one else did they would not be guilty of sin but now they have seen and hated both me and my father Rejection of Jesus is the rejection of the Father. And that puts him smack in the middle of the place of judgment. 
John 12, 44, if you want to turn back there, just a couple of pages. Uh, interesting way that this, this appears to us when Jesus is talking. He's, he's talking to a group of, uh, of leaders, I believe, in this context. But He says, uh, actually He doesn't say, it says in verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, just making a point, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have not come into the world. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. But the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. He, He has a plan. His plan is to vindicate the righteous. Who are the righteous? Is that the good people? It's the people who believe. It's the people who hear Jesus' words and say... That's for me. Those are words of life. I desperately need what He has. Those people are rescued, but the ones that, 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 that hear and reject, the ones who deny Christ when He's put on display before them are the ones that are, that are condemned to eternal punishment. Uh, I think it's Tim Keller talks about this um, Bosnian... I think he's a Bosnian theologian, Miroslav Volf. You guys heard about him? Um, but this is a guy that, that has he's been in the thick of these you know, this this um, uh, civil war in his country where he's 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 looked at people and watched people kill each other um, over religion uh, Christians against Muslims Muslims against Christians um, and, and it's and it's horrible what's taken place in this culture and 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 Wolf says about that he says you know people come along with this liberal notion to say I don't like to think of God as a judge. I like to think of him more as as just kind to everyone, and, and they, they have those ideas. And he says, you know, it's the most unkind you could think you could say. The only people that that, that that want to think of God not as a judge are people who have easy lives, right? You know, if, if your if your life is good, everything's happy, and no one's ever mean to you, yeah, you don't have to think of God as a judge. But if you're in one of these places where you have been beat down and oppressed. Where, where people ha- have done these wicked things to you, these, these horrible crimes to you for, for no reason but for the color of your skin, but for your, you know, your ethnic heritage, but for whatever it is, then you know that you desperately need God as a judge. Because how can you tell someone who's oppressed to bear up under that if there is no judge? How can you ask them, say, you know what, you need to endure that. Why? Why, why do I need to submit to suffering if there's no ultimate judge? Right? I mean, because if, you're, if, I'm, if I'm saying, I'm about to give you a beating right now, Henry, I just, I just, I just aim for you. But if I'm about to give you this beating, uh, I don't know that I could, but maybe. I'm old. Uh, but there's, there's no one that's going to defend you. There's no righting of that wrong. There's no one to, to, to come and to, to fix the error. Is there any reason you should just lay there and take it? Is there any, any reason not to pull out your knife? I know you have one. And, and you know, turn on me and say, "Don't touch me, man." No, I, I mean, there, there's no reason for him not to do whatever he needs to defend himself. But but Christ is not asking you to defend yourself, is he? That, that's not what he's asking for in this passage or elsewhere. All right, let me uh, let me kind of bring this to a close with some applications um, here. Actually, no, I left out a very important verse. I should not do that. Verse 25. Um, just kind of tacked on to the end of this section, but worth paying attention to. The last thing he says in verse 25 is this. He says, But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Jesus, he's quoting, he's quoting one of two passages. It's hard to say which one he's doing, but they're both perfectly appropriate to it. Um, it's either from John, or it's either from Psalm 35 or Psalm 69. And that, that phrase, hate me without cause, is in both of those. And, and, and both of them are perfectly suited because they talk about the, the innocence of the singer. He's saying he, he is not guilty in the situation. He's talking about the unfairness of the enemy. He's talking about the fact that, that he is bearing sins. 
He's talking about there being an ultimate judgment for the enemies, and he's talking about the rescue of the followers. Um, I think that applies to Jesus. Yeah, Jesus knows how to use Scripture well. Um, and that, actually, you'll find that pretty much any time you, you see an Old Testament quotation in the New Testament, look at the whole context of that quotation because, man, they are, they, so much more is going on than you'd ever suspect in just the first reading of it. And listen to the end of Psalm 69. He says, But I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify with Him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy, and He does not despise His own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise Him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of His servants shall inherit it, and those who love His name shall dwell in it. Isn't that cool? I mean, if you get out of just kind of reading that in terms of, you know, ethnic, historical Israel, but if you understand the, the bigger things going on in the song, here's, the, here's this, this message. Those who are suffering, those who are suffering wrongly, those who want to identify themselves with the name of God, is that He's got a plan to rescue them. And so all of this bad stuff Jesus is saying to His disciples, saying they're going to hate you and they're going to do bad things to you, when He says that to them, He says it to them with hope. He says, it's all according to plan. This is not a surprise. didn't sneak up on it. It's not that the fact that He has... That he's powerless to do it. But it's for His glory. It's, it's for the sake of working His redemption out in time and space for you. How, what do you do with this? First off, know the world doesn't love you. The world hated Christ first. Servants not greater than His Master. They're going to hate you. You just can't be surprised by that. Um, 1 Peter 4.12, Peter says, um, Do not be surprised... Uh, at the fiery trial that has come upon you. I'm not quoting that exactly right, but he says, don't be surprised. Duh. You know, disciples, you were with me. Anyone else, you know how Christ suffered. You can't be surprised when bad things happen to you. Um, well, this is something you need to hear right now. Your mind is clear. You're a little bit tired, but your mind is clear. Life is good. You're, you're, you're not being destroyed by the enemies of God. He says, this is according to plan, and you can't be surprised. Whenever it comes to say, oh, Jesus said this was going to happen. Now it's happening. What do I need to do with it? You've got to accept that it's going to happen. You have to say that this is part of His plan. But you have to bear up under that hate, that hatred. And how are you to bear up under it? This is really easy. Go back to the beginning, but, but I'm going to hit you from a different place. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 2. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. And Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. What are the weapons of our warfare? How do we fight against evil? The word. With the Word. What else? Yeah, the, the, the armor of God. It's, it's spelled out what our weapons are. Amazing there. But I, I'm just going to go simply back to what Jesus said earlier. What, what are your weapons? He didn't identify them as weapons at the beginning of the passage, did he? He just said, do these things. You're going to be my disciples. Honor my word. Pray. Obedience. Those are the weapons of your warfare. And what he calls you to do is to submit. He says that these bad people that do these bad things to you, submit to them. Honor me. Obey my words. If they ask you to sin, you have to say no. But whatever else they have to, they ask you to do, you got to bear up under it. Do you want to hear that? I don't want to hear that. I want to fight back. I want to be competitive. I want to, you know, go to war. But what he calls you to do is submit. He says, find a way to honor them. And do you know what's happening all over the world while these Christians are being persecuted? Do you know what they're doing with their captors? So many of them are fighting with the weapons of warfare. They're keeping faith with their fellow prisoners. They're praying day in and day out. They're praying for the guards who abuse them daily. And do you know what's happening? 
Some of those are being conquered. Their hearts are breaking. They're giving in. They're, they're seeing the gospel lived out in those people's lives and it's changing them. And again, I, we're not in the place where they are. Don't, don't kid yourself. You know, before I gave this talk on persecution this morning, Tim and I were down at Starbucks. <laughs> Life is good. We're at the beach. Everything's cool. But you have to know, this is you. And these are your people. And you need to keep faith with them yourselves by praying for them. There's a different life you're called to. It's going to make you different. And if it's not making you different, something is wrong. But when it makes you different, the closer you get to Christ, the more you look like Christ. Don't be surprised if they hate you all the, all the more. But if they hate you, and if they do bad things to you, Know this because they did it to Christ first and He is saying, I am pleased to have you be identified with me even in my suffering. And you can say, that's good because I'm like Christ and I want to be like Him in every way. All right, let's pray. Our Lord, we are so weak and so insufficient for these things. I am humbled to even talk about this knowing how personally weak I am and, and the temptations that I can succumb to. Uh, and we're talking about about wicked abuses happening that, that we would want to vindicate ourselves and justify ourselves and right our wrongs and take vengeance. But, oh Lord God, would you be merciful to sustain us and to sustain us in the way that would be pleasing to you by your Holy Spirit? Would you help us to submit and to honor and even to love our enemies as you called us to do and to put Christ on display before them? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks again.